You know, my name is Richard Williams. My stage name is Prince EA. Um, I'm a spoken word artist, content creator. I make videos about um, important topics. So I've done videos on <clears throat> everything from race to deforestation to climate change, kind of the whole gamut. And, you know, I've been working with Neste for the past year. We created three videos together, of which I received half a billion views. Um, we did one that went super viral on education. Um, in that game, it was for the game in the back, the EduCycle, which is a beautiful idea that has finally come to life. And essentially, we want to teach kids about how to take control of the destiny of the environment. Um, and we do it through gamification. We found the clever way of an edutainment um, type, of, type of idea that we wanted to create. So that's my relationship with, uh, with Neste. And yeah, I'm very happy to, to be amongst you all. Well, well, thank you for being here. Um, so I guess one of the first questions I want to kind of put to the panel and just kind of get some thoughts is, so you, you, both of the speakers kind of touched on this a little bit, but, but I want to talk about kind of the role of the global problem of carbon versus the national solution versus the local on the boots ground, kind of how that plays out. And I guess, first off, the question is, if it is a global problem, then why is it important for local places like the city of San Francisco and the state of California to take a leadership role in trying to fix that? Well, I think the answer to that question changed dramatically after November 8th. Um, so in San Francisco, we are not waiting for leadership at the national level. We believe that there's a tremendous amount that cities can do. There's a role for cities, there's a role for states, there's a role for nations. Over half of the world's population lives in cities. Cities account for 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So cities are where th things get done. It's not to say there's not a role for the national governments or the state governments. I think there's a tremendous role. And the real power comes when we're working together, when we can help each other and that our policies build on one another. I would say that when you think about uh, a, a role, there's a role for every level, from the individual to the local government, the business, the state, the na nation, and the globe. Paris was incredibly inspiring to me because it was a time where so many different levels of civil society came together with national governments on a common purpose. And I think if we can find it in our hearts to revisit that moment like we were in Paris, there's nothing we can't do. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say I'm really happy to be on this panel and uh, with Prince EA, who uh, my son is very familiar with and thought it was very cool that, that I was on a panel with him. So, uh, <laughs> That's good. Good, good. John's great, great. Good for you. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I think uh, you need to figure out wh where is change going to occur. In the 1970s, you know, amazingly under President Nixon facing a uh, a threat from a Republican challenger, Senator Muskie from Maine and his own party, uh, ended up signing all these incredible uh, pieces of environmental legislation, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. He created the EPA. Uh, and, you know, so you have to think about, well, wh where can you make a difference? And, and recently, uh, the former president of Shell USA, uh, Richard Hoffmeister, who, uh, uh, is a pretty re reasonable guy, was on a, a Commonwealth Club uh, interview, Climate One, which is a great uh, program, recommend the podcast. Uh, and he said, you know, right now, it just seems like there's a lot of gridlock in Washington. It's been that way for a little while. So we're, you're really better off trying to get stuff done at the local and state level. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, I think that's really where the energy ought to be. Uh, California is really leading, and then we've got some just great cities and towns uh, and, and neighborhoods that are, are doing things. So that's where, that's where the opportunity is. Let's go make hay there while we can. You know, my, my um, strategy, you know, I'm not a politician, but I have influence as a content creator, and I try to reach the individual. Uh, Deborah was speaking about behavior change, and I think that's necessary if we want any type of tangible progress to happen in these 
in these areas. Um, it, it's already, I mean, you, you can't really quantify what comes out of a YouTube view, but for me, it's about changing the consciousness of, of the people. And I think that's very important um, when, we, when we speak about you know, environmental responsibility. So you've all had different years of experience working in this space. Um, and I guess for someone who's new and who's saying, hey, what is this thing all about? What is this? Why renewable energy? Why renewable fuels? If you could distill down to them what something interesting that you've learned that can give them kind of a salient sort of thing, oh, I didn't know that. That's a very tangible sort of thing I can take away. Would you, what would you share with them? Dean, you're asking really good questions. That musical training is paying off. Uh, you know, um, I, 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 there is, I think about this all the time, and I, I probably overthink it. Uh, but uh, for me, it's just really come down to uh, a, a question about what kind of world do we want to live, you know, leave for future generations. Uh, and the actions we take now are really important. This, the emissions stay in the atmosphere for quite some time. So uh, they don't go away. You know, it's not like a, an oxy emission or, you know, it, they hang out there. The carbon hangs out in, in the atmosphere for quite some time. So every action we take will, has resonance. And so just think about that and to, to think about you know, that everything each of us does is really, really important. In, in one, of my, one of my pieces I did about a year and a half ago, it was called Dear Future Generation, Sorry, uh, where I, I quoted something called, I believe it's called The, the Rule of Seven. Uh, Native, Native Americans, they have this idea where, think about what they're doing now their impact on the environment. They, don't, they think about what's the impact going to be for the next seven generations. And that, is, that mindfulness, I believe, would be very useful in today's climate. It's hard to come down to a single sound bite. Um, and, when, and the question was about renewables. I think when I... I don't know that renewable is a word that really resonates with people. I think that's part of the problem is our language is so technical and uh, getting at people's hearts is what's going to capture them. And I think that's what, I mean, I just, if you've not heard Prince EA, it's, that's where he goes. He goes right to the heart and that's what motivates people. And so when I talk to people about um, why they should care, it, it comes down to the same thing, which is this is our planet, this is our home. If we don't take the actions, who will? And it's incredible what the power of one can be and there's so many ways that each of us can tap into our own power and discover it and bring it to bear on this issue. So it, it gets almost spiritual very quickly when I'm trying to connect to somebody on the why, and I think that's what people understand more than CO2 concentrations and the words like renewable. So it's, it's hard to get that soundbite in an emotional way, but I think that's what Prince EA does so beautifully. Oh, well, thank you. I think, I'll, if I can add to that, um, you know, one of, one of the, my favorite figures in history, Martin Luther King, uh, we all know his famous speech where he said, I have a dream. You know, he didn't say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> Sometimes when we speak about these issues, we speak to them with an air of doom and gloom. But it is inspiration that moves the masses, not doom and gloom. He also didn't say, I have a plan. <laughs> right? He said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a plan. People aren't inspired by plans. They're inspired by the vision. Sure, so let me, let me repeat that real quick. So he said that uh, we asked Prince EA's fans on Facebook, right, if they had any questions, and this is one of the questions that, that they had regarding the EduCycle game, which we'll learn a little bit more in a few moments. How can we incorporate this game in a homeschool environment, I think was the question. So. Gotcha. Um, I think we, we continue to, to scale up. Um, this is the first prototype. This is the first model of its kind. But we're going to continue to work on 
kind of bringing these educational uh, games to the masses um, through scale. I mean, that, that one, it, it's, it's in development. You know, it's not, it's not perfect. I think right now we're going to try to get it to different schools, but speaking to the question of homeschooling, we've got we've to scale up. We've got to use um, less expensive materials, which I think is, is totally possible and is totally the plan, and we'll hopefully see it in, in millions of homes across the world. So one of the things we'll do is in a little bit, we're going to learn a little bit more about the game and we'll kind of prevail, uh, that's part of our agenda we'll get to in just a minute. So um, that's the tease for everyone who's like, that's an interesting game. I want to know more about it. Stay tuned. We'll, we'll get to it in just a second. Um, any other audience questions? If and part of my dream on that is that environmental benefits are not just for the wealthy. They're not just for people who can afford the more expensive vehicles or expensive fuels, that everything we do is diffused out so that everyone, no matter your income level, can participate in this low carbon future. And that is something that I know governments are really working on in California with the cap and trade money, but also just trying to ask ourselves and challenge ourselves to look around at our constituents and see who is taking us up on these programs and who has barriers that prevent them from participating and how can we address and reduce those barriers. So yeah, one of the ways that we're working on that is making sure that the messengers look like their audience and sound like their audience. So it's very important for people to have credible messengers and voices and often it's not people who look like me or talk like me, it's people of the neighborhood, of the community, whether it's churches that we go to and ask church leaders to help us, or we hire people from the neighborhood, train them, they become ambassadors, they go door to door. The picture I showed was one of our ambassadors. We have an Environment Now program where we train people from the neighborhoods to go in and talk to their neighbors and talk to, um, the small businesses in the communities. We have an incredibly robust and wonderfully successful school education program where we start young with students talking about what inspires them. Tamar Hurwitz, can you raise your hand? So she is the head of our school education program and she knows that the thing that inspires children is animals. So we talk about animals and how what they can do to connect to animals they, what steps they can do in their lives today. So I think inspiration is not only the message, but it's also the messenger. And that's why it's so important to have multiple messengers, whether they are performers and rap artists or teachers in a classroom. That's how we're going to reach people, is to get that message being <coughs> spoken in language and by people who can be heard. Uh, our organization is a little more focused on uh, working from uh, with businesses, so uh, we don't we're not so consumer oriented. But one of the things we're really trying to help show and prove is that we can make this transition uh, and have more jobs for people. Uh, you know, we would really love to see Neste set up a production facility here. California building, producing renewable fuel. Uh, and that then people can say, yeah, I work at that Nest A plant. We, we produce renewable fuel. Uh, it's a, the, the Tesla story is now quite amazing. 22,000 jobs, direct jobs in, in California, building cars. And, and the traditional auto industry left California, said it was too expensive, couldn't be done. Uh, so, you know, we just want to see more and more people have jobs in this space. And, and through that, there will be a lot of education and pride. Uh, I'm laughing because I took out a slide. The next slide on that was going to show the regional population, but I just didn't have enough time. So yes, I mean, if you look at the San Francisco Bay Area, we're more like eight, almost 8 million people, and we have nine, ca nine counties in the Bay Area region and the cities. This, today at lunch, I had lunch with uh, Alameda County person, my equivalent for Alameda County. And in fact, what's funny is I was where she said, well, what should we do together? And I said, do you know about renewable diesel? 
And she said, no. And so I was actually pitching her on renewable diesel today, and I don't get paid by Nesty to do that, but I can't help myself. And just to hear that the city of Oakland, you know, in her backyard, in her county, she doesn't even know what they're doing. So there's lots of opportunities for cities and counties to join together, and we do all the time. And it's fun. It's so inspiring to work with your colleagues and see what's possible. So I want to ask Prince EA a question. Can I do that? Sure, man. OK. Rock so uh, we were talking before, and you said something a little provocative that, because, uh, you know, we have a mixed audience, and I don't know people's political persuasions, and it doesn't really matter, but you've heard here a couple references to feeling about uh, a little frustrated or disheartened or fearful of what's going on on the federal level. And I think you have an interesting perspective on that, and it gets to Travis's question about getting to people what inspires them as opposed to fear. So can you just share with us a little bit about your thinking on what your vlog was about? Oh, okay. Sure. You know, I, I did a vlog. Um, Does everybody know what a vlog, I know what a vlog is? A vlog, video log, which is like just a blog, which is a video, um, where I just, I just talk. That's it, yeah. Um, yeah, and this, the, let me see. The, the video was called um, Why I'm Happy Tr Trump Won. You know, it was Why I'm Happy Trump Won. And the, <laughs> and the, the video was, was about, um, it goes back to, to the, the inspiration. Uh, I was telling you before that when you when we get when we get sick in our bodies, um, maybe we haven't been taking care of ourselves, we haven't been exercising, we haven't been eating correctly, and then we get sick and something happens, and then we pay attention to what's happening in our bodies. It's a wake-up call, you know. Thank God for sickness for waking us up, or else we probably die without warning. And so I look at the current political whatever, whatever, that, that, that has occurred, and think of it as a wake-up call to us. Um, we have many ways of, of looking at what happens to us. I think in life it's better to, to say that things happen for us as opposed to to us. So what, what, what can we, how can we shift our perspective? How can we pivot into the positive? Because it is a, it is a, a million ways of looking at one thing. They say the only difference between a weed and a flower is a judgment. <laughs> so how can we, pop, because if, if we fight, what we resist will, will persist. Um, but there's a, there's a way in which we can get what we want without fighting against, and that's understanding. Understanding and love, I believe, is always the way forward. Yeah. I'll just uh, build on that is uh, that you know, the Chinese symbol for crisis is also the same for opportunity. Uh, so, you know, one way to kind of think about this is we, you know, President Obama was really a great leader and, and really we were moving ahead on climate change uh, solutions at a certain rate. Uh, and he didn't necessarily feel like he could do a lot more than that. And, uh, and one could argue that we got sort of caught into a, uh, a vision that was sort of incremental in nature. Uh, now, I think there's an opportunity to say, boy, we, we, we got to really step up our, our game here. Uh, and we got, you know, we don't have a friend in the White House, so how can we start thinking more boldly? And how can we start organizing and start showing more leadership at the state and local level? And then maybe through that bolder thinking, then all of a sudden in four years, we could just be start going at a much faster rate. That's what, how I like to think about it, and that's what I'm working toward. Well, well good, thank you. If you'll, everyone share with me again, thank for the panel. That was an inspiring conversation, and we appreciate them being here today. So thank you very much. Thank